Welcome to this podcast is making me thirsty, the number one destination for Seinfeld fans. This is episode 140. Today's guest is an actress, former ballet dancer and choreographer. You know her from her starring roles in films such as Jane Manfield's Car, The Campaign, and Frozen Ground, as well as her many TV appearances, including Three Sisters, Judging Amy, Two and a Half Men, Imposters, Truth Be Told, and of course... She played Sergeant Tierney in the season six episode of Seinfeld, The Beard. Please welcome Catherine Lanassa. Catherine, thanks for joining. Hey, guys. Thank you. Welcome to the show. I can't believe it's been 29 years, Catherine, since, no! the, Be yeah, since the Beard aired on NBC to 33 million viewers. Great episode. I mean, watched it again recently and like just incredible laughter throughout. Do you what know do you, that this yeah. episode was the episode they submitted for their Emmy consideration that year? Really? I did not know yes. that. Yep. Huh. Well. I, I think they might have done two, but this was one of them. I mean, this episode really didn't, didn't have any downs. I mean, really great episode. So, yeah, so take us back. So, 95, or this is February 95, so maybe they, they taped this in 94, what yeah. do you remember? Was there an audition process? What do you remember about getting getting this role as Sergeant Tierney? Now, these guys, I was really young, and I had a son, Henry. I still have a son, but he's not two. And I remember this was back in the day where there wasn't internet. <laughs> you you would have to go pick up your sides at night. So if you had a little kid, which nobody did but me, because my kid's in his thirties. So I was like, no actresses have little kids. And he used to like throw himself on the ground and like have like screaming fits. I still remember him on, it was Lieberman Hirschfeld casting, right? Yep, yep. And um, I don't know what they had read me for. It might've been that, but they just became like my employers. They just became sort of my fans. And it was in fact, Mark Hirschfeld later when he became head of NBC, basically gave me my, the series that I starred in Three Sisters. But um. I remember going in and later this guy, Brian, I can't remember his last name. They're the casting guy said that they felt that they had it. And then when I came in and read, they were like, nope, you know? And so I might've been the last one. I remember it was late at night. True story. I had never seen Seinfeld. Wow. I used to not. Yeah. I had, I had been a professional ballet dancer and I just wasn't, um, I'm going to put us on where I can see everybody. I wasn't on, um, I just wasn't into media much. I had, I had been married to Dennis Hopper when I was, you know, I don't know, 22 or something. And he didn't really watch, he just watched sports and CNN. So I just missed like my whole generation of television. So I was just flying blind out there, but I do remember just, Oh my God, particularly with the part where Jason goes off and he's like, you know, she, she's bald, treeless. I don't know what ended up in the show, but that guy would just riff. He is so brilliant. And he just, just every time they got to the, that part, it was so fun just to watch them, like, just riffing and improving. They were just really incredible. Yeah, I mean, George is one of our favorites, obviously. Uh, incredible scenes. Um, it's funny you mentioned Mark Hirschfeld and you mentioned uh, – you know, when you do your homework on our show, you'll see we talk to him. He's a great guy. So I'm glad to hear that he uh, was an integral part of your uh, of your career. That's awesome. Oh, uh, yeah. 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 It's he uh, was that was the big sitcom casting back then. And then I ended up they ended up casting me right shortly after that in um, Third Rock. And then that's how I ended up meeting and marrying French Stewart. Right, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this was, you mentioned you hadn't watched Seinfeld. This was also, I believe, like your first TV role, your maybe your second TV role. So you hadn't really, you'd done movies, but I hadn't done TV yet at that point. Is that, is that accurate? Do you remember like kind of getting thrust know. into a show like Seinfeld for the one of your first uh, TV shows must have been uh, a trip? Cause at that point, season six, they weren't firing on all cylinders. They were, they were, I mean, it was huge at that point. Yeah, I I don't know how many I had done. I mean, I came to acting late because I was a ballet dancer first. So I don't know. I you know, I don't really differentiate that much, but I I was auditioning a lot. I at that time there wasn't streaming. And so I was always the favorite of writers because I was kind of I was the pretty girl that was weird, right? But back at that time they really wanted the networks really wanted people that were pretty straightforward 
So they weren't so interested in a quirky, pretty girl. It was all sort of, you know, like these, you, you know what I mean? Everyone was sort yeah, of yeah. typecast. You were the serious, pretty girl, or you were the quirky, funny looking girl. But there wasn't right. so much of these, you know, this quirky, pretty girl thing. And I was just a very, I just have always had a very weird sense of humor and have been more interested in kind of making myself laugh, finding what I think is funny, you know, yeah. then. It's interesting you said that quirkiness because I don't know if you know this, but a line you deliver in the episode is, is, in, is in Seinfeld lore. It's much talked about as, as kind of a quirky line and your delivery has that what you just talked about. It's funny and it's like quirky and it's a little. Let me guess. Yeah, is it's it, a little different, but it, it's should like. Should we put him on the poly? No, but I love that line. Should we put him on the poly? That's a great line. What no, it's when line? you say, um, have you ever seen the show? And you like, oh, you're yeah. like a little, uh, like you pause for a second before you say it, like catch it. <laughs> Do you ever see the show? It's like this, you, you, it's like this little, like, uh, I don't know how to say it. It's like a loof or something. You just kind of like throw yeah. it at him, expecting him to just be like, no or yes. And he, and you kind of catch him on it. But, um, yeah, that line is talked about often because it's, it's delivered uh, in such a in such a different way than, than we normally, you know, the, even the Who rest knew? Of the, yeah, yeah. So just wondering, uh, you know, what your thoughts were. If you even like had a thought on that, or just kind of came it's out. It's so that funny be because that scene is the only scene that I've really seen, you know, since then, because that one comes back a lot. Um, you know, that scene in the police station. For some reason, I remember a lot of the scene. I remember, I think if I'm going to be honest with you, I was, I was always trying to be really alive. You know, part of my acting technique is like to not have, you know, have everything sound like a script, like you're just thinking of it or you're just, and I remember it was kind of like that, like, oh, you know, just kind of as if I was just thinking of it. So maybe there was something to that. But I do remember at that time, like now I could give a shit, but at that time being young and taking my craft so seriously, I remember being really bothered that they cut out the pause before, um, I think we should put him on the poly. There was like a longer pause. Like I made him sweat a little bit. I'm sure it was just for time. And I remember thinking, that's not it. <laughs> I know way better than Larry David. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so speaking of speaking of Larry, you know, tell us a little bit about the the relationship and kind of how how he was on set. Obviously, Carol Leifer wrote this episode. Yeah. Uh, you know, she's gone on to to great things, obviously, with Larry, et cetera, but what do you remember? We all know Larry now, but kind of Larry behind the scenes. You were a young he actress. Great. At that he, he was great. That was, you know, I've, I found like sitcoms can be like the best of times, the worst of times. You know, I think it's, um, I mean, there was, it, it, sitcoms were rough back in those days. Like if you didn't deliver at the table read, you got fired. I mean, it was, there was just, you would get a script like one second before. And if you weren't funny, it was just, it was a lot of pressure. Um, it was, a, it, it was like that, but Larry was, what I was going to say, but I've just talked a whole bunch before that was um, that when you work with the best, you know, it just tends to be kinder and gentler because they trust themselves more. So they're not, I just found a lot of times in sitcoms, they would try to micromanage the comedy and they would be second guessing themselves. And now like at my age, you know, you kind of know more about the process than they do. Like you'll watch showrunners and writers freak out and squeeze the comedy out. And even though they're your boss, so you can't really say anything, but you're like, just relax guys, you know? <laughs> It was funny. So Larry was not at all like that. They were very confident. They were very chill. The whole thing was very kind and, and very fun. And I just felt like they liked it. They liked doing it. They, like I said, they would just riff. Yeah. yeah I mean, the, the scene you mentioned earlier, we'll put him on the pie and then you and uh, Gus there with the cigar are, are you know, asking him mm -hmm. the questions about Merrill's place, you know, yeah great scene and when jerry like just rips all the stuff off it just goes nuts at the end um you know you're there just arms folded no uniform on in that scene we were wondering about this uh, uh early before you came on did you ever have a date with jerry in, in your mind like how that played out or was this sort of like a pre-date poly if he passes you'll go on a date if not because it just seemed like you were talking about a date the date we never see it on screen 
And then you're taking the poly and you're in your uh, your civilian clothes, if you will. And he just bursts out. I'm wondering, uh, you know, what your thoughts were on how that all kind of wrapped up or if we ever got to see you two together. I think the idea was that we were dating, but I'm sure that we would that we would. What was what you guys know better than me? What was the setup? Well, you know, um, George went to get a. Uh, you know, Lou was doing a sketch artist of the girl that Kramer used to know, right? Yeah. She beautiful, blah, blah, blah. Jerry saw you, right? And then you guys set up a date later in the in this, in this this episode. He's on the phone with you. You're not present. And he's like, oh, you're going to bring your gun? I wouldn't bring that on the first date, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, he just shows up with Kramer at the precinct again. And you get, you get Kramer to go do the, you know, the... Uh, I'm trying to blank out what it's called. Line up. Line up, oh, yeah. Line up, yeah. Right. And, and then from that, Kramer goes there, and then you and Jerry just kind of chit-chatting, and that's when you bring up the the great line of, uh, you know, have you seen the show? Um, yeah, yeah. And what's, what's super interesting, and, you know, obviously, uh, you know, your life is is well-documented, but obviously you're now married to one of the famous Melrose stars. <laughs> my uh, One of my favorites, Jake Grant Show, of course. Now I gotta ask you. You, you mentioned know you never mentioned seen Melrose plays. I would. You just took my question. I was just saying you never watched Seinfeld, and now you're telling me you never watched Melrose either. I have never watched Melrose plays. Wow. Yeah, I think that's why I ended up with Grant because he was like <laughs> you know the heartthrob of my generation, but I was you know busy you know marrying old guys, and um, <laughs> and I remember when I met him, I was like, oh yeah, I think that's the guy everybody's crazy about. And I just he was just like a guy with bad pants. He just had these terrible pants. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest is history. <laughs> yeah, the rest is history. Listen, well, like you said, you weren't watching TV in those early to mid-90s, right? And that's like Seinfeld the Melrose, two different audiences per se, but like they were going head-to-head Wednesday nights for a little bit. Mm-hmm. And we were talking about this earlier. It's so interesting how back then, obviously Melrose was on Fox and uh, uh, Seinfeld yeah. was on NBC, yet they were kind of promoting Melrose Place within the show was, and again, you weren't a big TV person at the time, but I'm just wondering if there was any kind of banter on set, like, wait, why we promote another show? Or no. it, was, it was funny, just no. funny. No. Good it, old it days. It was just a, probably a joke, time. you know, one of those Seinfeld, like, things about human nature, you know, that we don't admit, you know, our guilty pleasures. Right. I think and- that was it. And the whole tie-in with Elaine, you know, being the beard for for the for her gay uh, friend, um, was interesting too because I, I think that kind of overlapped over everything. Like I know Carol Lee for I believe based that on a true story um, where she had to do that for for a friend. So I think that's where it came from. But you know, Chris mentioned it earlier about Carol Lee for. Um, you know, was she, if, do you recall maybe in, in the, the the audition or even just during uh, shooting how involved? Um, she was with anything as far as that goes, as far as writing goes, or was it just Ackerman and Larry kind of running the show? Or did you? Oh have any no, kind of no, she was around a lot. I I remember Carol well, um, and I'm not sure if it's because she was just such a powerhouse in comedy at that time, and I and I would see her in other rooms, but Carol was really involved, and I remember spending a fair amount of time with her. I don't. She never was on Third Rock, was she? Did Carol ever write on Third Rock? <laughs> like, I have a lot of memory of Carol Leifer. Carol Leifer is very vivid to me. Um, and I don't know if it's because, I don't know if she ever went on and worked on Third Rock, where French was. But I just feel like Carol was someone that I was in community with for a long time in L.A. Yeah, she's, uh, I mean, a hell of a career. And sure, yeah, Larry Sanders show. This episode, you know... Like you said, it got submitted for an Emmy. So you take it. So you're, are you on set all week? Because there's so much going on in this episode. Your stuff is amazing. You mentioned George earlier with the toupee and Elaine and and, and the uh, Tupperware. Like there's so much going on. Were you kind of on set watching all this like from the stands or were you just kind of working your scenes and... Kind no, of you're, with- you were around a lot. I mean, you you know, usually have, you know, free reign to just walk around and watch stuff. I mean, I always like to watch. I like, I like to watch like Peter <laughs> Sellers. Um, <laughs> no, I like to, um, 
I like to watch the work when I'm when I'm working just to see what's going on, you know, and when you're working with people that are that great. Yeah, you want to you want to watch it. I mean, they were brilliant. They were brilliant. They were brilliant. I mean, there's a few things that I've seen live that I won't forget. Like I got to watch with Dennis one time, Miles Davis um, recording an album. <laughs> and um, I got to watch, uh, you know, George Costanza go off about a ball girl. And it was fucking brilliant. <laughs> You know, it was also brilliant. I mean, they were brilliant guys. You know, they were, what's his name? Michael Richards. Weird, right? You know, I had a couple weird dates with Michael Richards after that appearance. We, really? Well, that's interesting. I did. If you I, don't, did. I mean, we, we, we spoke with a longtime girlfriend of his. Uh, yeah, he must have broken up right. Uh, no, right what before. was her name? What was her name? Ann, Ann Tolman. It wasn't Ann Tolman. And we've also talked to a few. <laughs> we've talked to a few co-stars, of, uh, guest stars on Seinfeld, who who have had um, maybe not dates, but have been axed out by Michael Richards. But you know, you could disclose so what you'd like and what you wouldn't. Dates like. with Michael Richards. We went to um, the House of Blues, and then we had some other. And then I remember just going and hanging out at his house a little bit, like during the day. Um, I had a little kid, you know, so he was in school. And so I think we just hung out during the day a little bit, like by the pool and stuff, nothing serious. And one day he just doesn't call me anymore. I was talking to him regularly. He doesn't call me anymore. And then about two weeks later, it's Valentine's day. And he calls me and he tells me and he's freaking out because I think he probably had a girlfriend that he was cheating on. And he's telling me that, um, He's freaked out because the National Enquirer is going to do a story about us. And really? I, yeah. I didn't say anything to anybody about him. And, you know, I mean, I had been married to Dennis. I never said anything to anybody about Dennis. So I wasn't going to start then. And uh, after that, I had the National Enquirer outside my house for two weeks straight, like a venereal disease, just at my house all day, every day. Wow. Just waiting for me to come and go. I don't know if they ever ran a story or not. I was like, why are you freaking? All I thought to myself was, why are you freaking out? We went on a couple right. of dates. We didn't do anything to be embarrassed about. I'm single. You're single. Like, what's there to freak out about? There isn't any story here. Yeah. So let's, he might yeah, have had it, a story. He might have had a story, but I had a story. <laughs> he might have had a story to be worried about. I didn't have a story. And then. So this is what was funny at the time, though, it really hurt my feelings because I was not accustomed to men just ghosting me. I had not had that experience at that time. I don't know if I've had it since, to be honest. <laughs> and at the time, he said um, he would say stuff like uh, I remember he said to me one time, oh, what if you end up to be more talented than me? Or what if your career eclipses mine? And I think he was just trying to flatter me. So years later. So that I don't hear from him. He freaks out about that. Then I'm left with this venereal disease based on his fame of this. And I was broke. I was single mom. I had a little kid. I lived in a little bungalow off Larchmont, which at the time wasn't that fancy. And um, I was like, damn, like I couldn't do anything about them. You know, I couldn't call a lawyer. And so years later, when Three Sisters happened, um, we went to Upfronts. That's the next time I saw him. And we, he gets brought out on stage. He had his show. What was his show? Kramer or Michael Richards? The, the Michael, Michael Richards show. Yeah. 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 And then that show got canceled and they, they replaced it with my show. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, so on set, you're doing all these scenes and like, oh, wow. Is how did how does how does Michael Richards ask you out on set? Just kind of I don't remember. It wasn't that big a deal. No, you know, it really wasn't that big a deal. I don't remember. He might have asked me for my phone number. Look at that. You know, yeah. I mean, nothing from Jerry's end though. I remember him saying like, "Oh, Catherine has a little mouth shaped like a bow" or some shit like that. Back when <laughs> people could say fucking anything to you, you know, at any time. Um, but he was perfectly nice. Jerry was perfectly nice. They were all perfectly nice. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, no, I can't remember. It's something good. It'll come back to me. <laughs> something yeah, good. Like I, oh, I'll remember it. So Lieberman Hirschfeld. So 
Lieberman Hirschfeld had got me from this casting director named Rick Bagano, and they had said, you got to meet this girl. And so then after that, they, you know, after I got, went in and got Seinfeld, Seinfeld was the first thing. And um, then they started bringing in, me in on all their comedies. And so they brought me in on this comedy it was the George Went show. George Went from Cheers was going to have his own sitcom. Really? And um, so I auditioned for it. I mean, I got all the way up to the network test. And it was for CBS. And I went home that night and I found out that um, I got a call the next day that said that I didn't get it because um, they had wanted the girl on Seinfeld that was on Seinfeld the night before. And then Lieberman Hirschfeld was like, they didn't want anyone they read. They wanted a girl like the girl on Seinfeld. And, you know, why didn't, why, you know, it was kind of like, you know, why didn't you idiots bring me somebody like this girl on Seinfeld? That girl was really great. And they were like, it was the girl on Seinfeld. That was the girl on Seinfeld. And then I remember, wow. yeah. So then they ended up actually reading me again, but they just wanted me to do it like I did it on Seinfeld. And I was like, but Seinfeld was this person <laughs> with this writing. And this right. is this person with this writing. I still didn't get it, but I just wanted to tell you guys. Yeah. Story. And uh, <laughs> it's interesting too, because George Wen show has a ton of uh, Seinfeld alum in it too. Uh, Pat Finn and Brian Doyle Murray and Mark Christopher Lawrence. I mean, it's loaded with uh, with Seinfeld alum too, which is funny. It was the same casting director. There you go. There you go. I wanted to tell you guys that story. That's all I got. It's a uh, it's a tight knit set. I mean, but those guys, yeah. I mean, from what we've heard, they're all good guys. You know, yeah. What he was, what he was worried about, who knows? But uh, uh, for the most part, we heard good good things especially from his old his old his ex who you know was really good to kind of her her little brother who kind of had a lot of issues so all in all we've heard great things about michael richards um that poor but, guy man what the, what yeah. is, anything happened to him i mean he he had his rant and then that just end him as he canceled forever or what what does yeah, he do he's not, he made a little comeback on like curb with larry david and he's done like comedians of cars with jerry you know uh, those guys they're loyal right so they they'll keep throwing lifelines to him but you know i think he's pretty much set for life right yeah right all those people all those people <laughs> on that thursday night lineup from 1995 or done just fine <laughs> yeah so three yeah. sisters so three sisters was another hirschfeld kind of uh nbc pilot i know vicky lewis another alum was on that show as well she's fantastic yep. yeah and aj langer diane cannon peter bonners from uh from from uh newhart uh jerry the dentist from newhart he played uh he played my dad diane cannon played my mother and then aj and vicky were my sisters yeah talented group and then Lieberman Hirschfeld also did uh third rock oh yeah that was yeah um it's interesting you know you brought up the kind of behind the scenes and and, and Michael Richards and, and all and kind of how that went down but we love to hear um a lot of times our guest stars uh were invited to the uh rap party for the season do you recall that at all? Would that if you were invited, if you were there, what what that was like the season six rap party? I'm sure I was probably invited. I don't, you know, to be, I hate to say, it, but I can't remember. That's fair. I mean, maybe it wasn't uh, mm -mm. anything. I don't remember. Do I don't remember? remember it being very eventful. You know, it was only it was only 27 years yeah, ago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was a party 27 years ago. What if I was all Ray Man and I could tell you what I was wearing? No. Um, yeah. No. It's funny the um that episode is called the beard, but you know in in my head it's I I just think of it as the the lie detector or Melrose episode, right? I mean, yes. you and and you played such a an important role in that. So I'm just curious, how does a how's a ballet dancer from New Orleans, right? Like make that leap, like because you're I mean you're you're acting <laughs> the in, leap. No, yeah, <laughs> no, I, uh, no. Um, part of the, this is what I forgot what I was going to tell you. I'm going to tell you this really quickly. But when um, when I think back sometimes on that time, you know, Me Too is a little, you know, like all movements imperfect. But I can remember, you know, it's, it's some of it's been good for us. But um, I can remember going into a room one time for another comedy after that. And this guy had my picture and he goes, goes what did you play on Seinfeld? The big nose girl? <laughs> 
Yeah, that's what I was thinking about. Uh, like, wow, okay. Was there a big nose group? Did they have that on side though? Yeah, well, we, it was a we nose just, job. We, we, yeah, go ahead. Ohio. We, we talked Yeah, we, we just spoke to her, Susan Dial. It was um, a prosthetic, obviously, and yeah. uh, tasteful. Yeah. Um, yeah. So with ballet, um, so I think I was always the funny girl. I'm a third generation class clown. I even have my card. Um, so I was always that kid, you know, that was making other kids laugh. I was just always a really funny kid. Um, I had a bunch of male cousins. I have 16 first cousins on my other, on my mother's side of the first eight. I'm the only girl. So it's all, um, maybe the baby of the eight first eight is, is a girl too, but it was just all boys in me. So I kind of had this, and my father was the funnier one of my, my father was funny. My, his mother was funny. Um, so I have this very male sense of humor. And um, I'm from New Orleans. And I just think that even when I was dancing, my strength was my acting ability. And I know that sounds like a weird thing to say, but I was just a very emotional dancer. And I think I was interested even in dance. I, I was aware that what it was about was like sort of telling a story, even if it was abstract. Does that make sense? Like music sure. kind of can tell a story about yeah. rage or joy or love or whatever. So um, I just remember seeing this documentary when I was pregnant with Henry. I'd moved out to LA with Dennis I, and Dennis Hopper and he we'd gotten married and I thought, Oh, I'll be able to do all this kind of experimental dance that I didn't have the money to get paid nothing for. You know, I just was really wanting to do a deep dive on funky dance and there wasn't really anything to do out there that it wasn't at the level of New York. So I saw this documentary about Sandy Meisner when I was pregnant and I just, it was a documentary that Sidney Pollack had made and I just got obsessed with it. Um, and I, figured out how to get an interview with him. And I got in his class and I just studied acting. And I don't know, I think, I just think I always had an ear for timing. Maybe it's the musicality of dance. I don't know. I think I've always had good timing and I love language. My family is, um, my, my great grandmother was an English teacher and they like make fun of people that put the prepositions in the wrong place. I had to teach myself to te speak more poorly so that I didn't sound like a nerd when I was in high school. You know what I mean? I had to pick up bad habits on purpose so I could sound like everybody else. Um, so I think I've always liked language and then I have this ear for comedy. I mean, I grew up, I grew up like so many people, so common, just whatever that lineup was, what it was like Mary Tyler Moore and Carol Burnett and yeah, yeah. I mean, I never missed that. And I still remember sitting, you know, in this tract house in Charleston on the floor in front of the TV by myself watching Mary Tyler Moore, Bob Newhart. And then I was the kid, the minute Saturday Night Live came on in like the 70s, I was probably not old enough to be watching it, but I would stay up late and watch that on some tiny TV in a room by myself. You know, like I just was, I loved all those people. And I mean, I just thought it was the best. I watched all the Phyllis's. I watched all of that shit. So, and then oddly, Jay Sandridge, who did all of those Mary Tyler Moore's I later got to work with, he directed, I think, all of them. Um, he directed Three Sisters for a little while. Wow. Yeah, I think that goes to show you, like, just being involved in the arts, you know, whether it's starting with ballet, it, it can take you to many places and it, they can kind of interweave, right? Yeah, like nothing about comedy or acting was available to me, right? And so I really wanted to dance. So I, so it's kind of, it just, you know what I mean? It just found its way. I just found yeah. my way. I remember in New York before I quit dancing, before I moved to LA, um, trying to go to an acting class. I think in my mind, I, I, I just knew, I think I'm, I'm supposed to be doing this. I'm a little more interested in this part of performing that I didn't really care that much about being the greatest dancer. I was just more interested in, I don't know the storytelling part and, but I went to a class and it was kind of traumatizing. <laughs> it was like some crazy mean Russian teacher. I just think I had bad luck. So I thought, Oh, I'm too scared to do that. But then when I was with Dennis, he would have all his auditions in the house. And so I got to kind of see it. And then I got to be on, 
on set with him and and I got to see it more and more and sort of understand it. I actually did um, even work in the art department for him. So oh, I've wow. sort of, yeah, I've done a lot of, I've done costumes for things. I've done a lot of all the sides. Yeah, but, he's um, I mean, clearly a, a brilliant actor. Um, and it's funny, the beard, we talk about ballet, uh, back to the beard in Seinfeld. Yes. Elaine, Elaine is actually going to the ballet in yes. that episode. It was kind of meant to be, right? That uh, that episode happened for you. Yes. Yeah. And speaking of meant to be too, you mentioned that, you know you kind of you had all those relatives and cousins and and uh, a lot of male centric uh, comedy around. Your father, you said, was really funny. And it's interesting. Your character is is plays you know a sergeant, and she's surrounded yeah. by all men in the police station. And you kind of hold court and you know run the show there with uh, Lou and everyone else and. You know, your timing is definitely evident in that scene as well. We talked about it earlier. With Have you seen the show and just the way you're delivering lines? So, well, thank you so much. I think it all tied together really well. I mean, that was that's Hirschfeld. He finds the person for the role. I mean, you were you had the right personality to, to kind of be in that scene with like there was like eight or nine guys in that scene. If you count all the different cops and the, you know, the uh, it's the, so the, funny. The I recently artist. had an interview with somebody for some movie or something that I was doing. I don't remember. And she said, I think you like characters that have power. I was like, wow, I never even thought about that. But yeah, I think I like power characters. That's probably true. Did you have any? We didn't touch. Oh, sorry. Um, we didn't touch on it. But um, speaking of that, um, you didn't have any scenes with Julia Louise Dreyfus, but um, curious if you had interactions with her on the set because she kind of has that same kind of presence as well, where she, you know, is with the three other, you know, male performers and kind of has to have that role. I had little to do with her. I just saw her from afar. You know, I used to see, um, what's his name? I used to see, um, I keep calling him George. Jason. Uh, Jason. Yeah, I used to see Jason at soccer sometimes when our kids were little because we lived in the same neighborhood. Yeah, and it's funny you mentioned Jason was pro probably the only, you know, trained actor on that show, right? Jerry was a stand-up um, Michael Richards kind of did like Fridays and kind of uh, that kind of stuff. And like SNL with Julia, like, so they made it happen. They made the one of the most successful shows of all time. And obviously you, you kind of, you fit in like a glove but back to the scene. I love the scene where you're kind of just, your arms are folded when Jerry's taking the actual polygraph. I mean, I had to imagine you had to do many takes there. I mean, I, and you had such a serious face, but I know you're a great actress, but there had to be a lot of takes on that because that was just pure silliness. Yeah, it was pretty silly. No, it was it was really fun. Yeah, and he was he was it was the same to just watch him riff and go crazy it was really fun. I mean, it's just super fun, you know. It's super fun to watch people. And I love acting. I still love acting, you know. And the better the people you work with, the more fun it is because it's just to watch them do what they do, and they're so good at it. And also, just Seinfeld, it's like. What a joyful time. It was joyful to be on it. It was number one. You know, they were so good. They were so well paid. They were, you know, it was just like everything was kind of great. You know, there was no bummer about being there whatsoever, you know? Right. And you mentioned it was so early in your career. What Was there anything you took from that experience, like the professionalism, uh, the welcomingness that you kind of either didn't see in other shows or tried to kind of emulate as you kind of move forward in your career? I really think the thing that stuck with me the most was just um, Jason's freedom. Jason's freedom. And I would have to say, I think I would have to say all of their freedom, but like, and just um, Michael, you know, just the way that Kramer crazy, like slide in. I mean, I felt the same way about, you know, when I was married to French Stewart, I mean, he was, brilliant too like just these people that are just they're just they've just got it they've got that creativity and that quick mind you know and they're just all firing and when you got those three guys in a room you know and and her you know and they're just I think I think the thing is when particularly back then with comedy it was kind of weird that was like I mean, it was king and if you just got one of those sitcoms you were gonna make it you know what I mean and you were gonna your career was going to be made, you felt like. And there was so much pressure about kind of getting it right. It was so competitive. I mean, you go to auditions and there would just be, you know, maybe a hundred people for your part, you know, even when you started moving up the ladder, 
even when you were just going in for producers, there might be 50 people for your part that they would see. They might see, but even at that point, even the final rungs were huge rungs, you know? And so to see them just so sunk into their creativity and their improvness and that it wasn't about getting it right. It was about just being imaginative and free and loose and riffing. And, you know, it just moments like that, those are kind of moments that I, you know, I kind of grip onto and, and, you know, put in my back pocket. It's like, Oh, it's done like that. I mean, I remember working with Lily Tomlin. I did this show that never aired with her. And um, we actually did like six episodes of this comedy for HBO and, and Lily would have like a trunk full of like a, of, of property and the way that she worked with her property. And she had these gloves and she's, you know, was just super specific about all of her stuff. You know, it's stuff like that. Or I worked with Eric Idle one time and man, that guy, like he just knew every line and he was so prepared, like right on the first beat, like the first rehearsal, no script, no nothing, totally just, you know, there, you know, and, and just so Seinfeld was one of those moments for me, one of those seminal moments that where, where you just, um, you're encouraged to be really free with your own creativity. I mean, I didn't know that I could do that until I got the campaign. When I got the campaign with Will Ferrell, I was already probably like maybe 42. And I, um, I, if I didn't ad lib, I wasn't going to make it in the movie. Do you know what I mean? And I didn't know that I could do what those guys could do. Cause so often, you know, particularly in comedy, they want you to be like, just right on the book. So I think that was why it was so special to see Jason and these guys, you know, like they've written it in a rhythm. They want to hear it, but those guys would just go off and it was, it was brilliant. Yeah. I'd have to imagine, you know, those are some, you worked with some heavy hitters on that one. Uh, uh, you know, Will Ferrell and Zach. Um, so I would have to imagine that was years of all of that knowledge you just talked about and experience to really know, okay, I could pull this off. Like, let's do this. And then you nailed it, you know, like um, you were on Seinfeld season six. Again, that, that made me think about it when you were talking about like, you were, you're lucky to be there for season six. I mean, that was like the cusp of, of it all, right? It started to change a little bit after that by seven and eight, Larry David wasn't there. And it's a great show. People have their opinions, but you were there at pinnacle time. Like you said, Jason was firing all cylinders, doing his thing. Like, um, so just being able to see that must, yeah, like you said, just sounded like it was, it was incredible. Um, have you, have you seen him on, um, Miss Maisel? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really think that guy should have a huge career. I mean, I'm sure he's doing okay, but I, I keep thinking, I used to play poker with him sometimes. I forgot about that until just recently. I used to see him at this silly poker game and, um, I just was like, I would, I remember saying to him in the next five years, you're going to have like another huge show. And I just don't know why that guy hasn't had another huge show. Yeah. That guy's brilliant. We, we agree. I mean, he's our favorite character of all time. He's um, brilliant. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know. Maybe we'll hire Chris's different point of view. I, I really think it, it's one of those typecast things, unfortunately, where it's like, especially right after Seinfeld, it was like, they just saw George and it maybe was hard to shake it. I, I don't know, but I agree with you. I mean, he's brilliant. And, um, his character is amazing. And, and you were, again, I know you've talked about it, but his episode that, you know, the, the episode you were on with him with the hair, with the hair piece and everything, it just, you know, it lends himself to so good George. Cause he did, he played that like cocky guy with the hair so well, and then immediately switched back into George as soon as Elaine, like threw it out the window, he was right back at the, just being the way it's just, that's, that's great acting right there. You know? Yeah, he's terrific. I, I loved this season of Miss Maisel and I was really um, happy to see him in there. I mean, frankly, it's like, it's a hard thing about acting, you know? It's like, you can just, God, I've gone from the tops of like getting the Will Ferrell thing and then, you know, you just go totally back down again and then you go back up again and then you go back down again. It's like, to see someone, you know, like him, like Jason, you know, not always being on the top is like, okay, this is just the nature of this beast, you know, you know, to see, I, cause I just think that guy should have like everything. I love that guy's acting. I think he's brilliant. <laughs> I think he's totally brilliant. But you know what? He reached the top, you know, it's, it's, it's oh, a tough yes. I just, I just mean like, yeah. you know, 
just to, to see a someone like that just kind of ebb and flow, you know, it's like reminds yeah. you that it's you. I think we forget sometimes, you know, you just and, think and he met, he mentions it in like in a recent interview, like he couldn't believe like Brian Cranston, who was played Tim Watley on Seinfeld. Yes. And then from there kind of took off and he like, you know, it's just one of those things, right place, right time. But good actors are good actors. But finding that right role is like, right. That's that's the holy grail, right? I'm, I'm still waiting to be discovered. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, Kathy, let me ask you, you mentioned your son. And we always like to ask if, you know, the younger generation uh, are Seinfeld fans. Does he does he watch Seinfeld? I don't think he does watch Seinfeld. He's kind of serious. <laughs> He's a little serious. He's really into art and music. He's a little more like his father. He's not as silly as I am. <laughs> well, I mean, he's got to. He's got to watch your the, episode. Yeah, he had the benefit of uh, of you know growing up with French Stewart. He would you know like go out and buy him a gorilla suit or whatever. So, so yeah, I'm actually doing um, designing women the play from the original writer Linda Bloodworth right now in Atlanta. Oh wow! Oh, nice. Yeah. That's yeah. So, oh, that's where, that's where you are now, Atlanta. I'm in Atlanta doing the play. Yeah. Very we kind nice. of moved here. It wasn't really planned, but Grant was on Dynasty that wouldn't end. <laughs> 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 well, tell you know, tell not that tell we Grant really wanted it to, but we didn't expect it. it. Just kept going and going and going, and now. Our eight, I have an eight-year-old, and now my eight-year-old's been in school here for five years. So it's like, I guess we're living here, at least for a little oh, while. Wow. Yeah, we'll see. Well, make sure you make sure you hit up the landmark diner. Uh, That's near me. Yeah, mention my name. You, you for a meal on me. Uh, okay. <laughs> now it's at um, it's right there on Ponds, right? Yeah, is that the it's, it was yeah. the first diner ever in Atlanta. My wife's uncle opened it, so. The whole Are thing. you kidding me? No. Oh yeah, that's near. It's it's at, at Ponds and Highland. That's the landmark, right? Yeah. Yeah, in that little parking lot. Yeah. Yeah, I know that place. <laughs> Hit it up. Okay. And uh, I Grant, walk there, man. And Grant, it's it's funny. Just the interconnections of the show. We spoke with Dan Cortez, who played Grant's brother on Melrose Place. It's it's never ending the connections between the two shows. But um, I also grew up in a neighborhood called Melrose Place. Wow. So I think, and then I tested on three shows that I didn't get that Grant got. So three different shows that he did after Melrose Place, I almost got and didn't get. So I guess we were meant to be. And then be. where I met him is um, he replaced me kind of on Big Love. I was playing Jennifer Goodwin's boss and I fired her. And then he comes in and hires her. And it's, you know, a new storyline. She starts dating her boss. Wow. Yeah. Look yeah. at that. Well, listen, from uh, Miles Davis, like you mentioned, to George Costanza, you've had a hell of a run. We, we, we can't thank you <laughs> enough. Thanks for spending some time with yes. us. And, and thank good you. Luck with, good luck with the play. Now, will you email this to me and I'll promote it? Like when we're yeah, back yeah, in yeah. theater. It's going to be a or few was weeks. Or it just on live just now? No, no, no. We're live. no. It'll be a few weeks. We have a bit of a backlog, but we'll definitely let you know when it goes live. No, for I, sure. I very much appreciated that you guys were doing this. I mean, I just love the passion. And I, I always felt like it's always been um, really important to me that it, it's been a really cool thing to say that I did. You know, it's definitely been a little feather in my cap. In fact, it's at the end of my bio and in the theater i was like and i got to play one of his iconic girlfriends on <laughs> on seinfeld I love it love it yeah thanks guys thank you. you're the best Catherine. have a great night okay thank you bye, -bye.